Mount Pleasant Fire Department is working hard to make the town much safer for its citizens and businesses. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with Fire Chief Mike Nixon for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Mount Pleasant Fire Chief Mike Nixon, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Hey, Quentin, thanks for having me again. Oh, you're very welcome. Needless to say, you've been the Fire Chief of the Mount Pleasant Fire Department for five years. As we sit here right now, Chief, what is this, your snapshot of your Mount Pleasant Fire Department? Right. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I have been the chief five years and, you know, I, I love working here. It's been a pleasure and a blessing to be the chief, but also, you know, work in the community that I live in for close to 20 years now. So, so again, thank you for having me. But, you know, the last five years, we've, we've really tried to, to, to get the department going here and what we've done in the last uh, five years. Um, most recently, though, is the, is the automatic aid agreement that comes to mind. Uh, with the automatic aid agreement last year, we we joined with seven area departments. Um, so what that essentially means is we previously had mutual aid where we'd have to call for help on a big fire or a big incident or to fill in for our station. But with the automatic aid agreement, um, that aid comes automatically. So we've done it for a year now. We've seen that you know training collectively, working on our, our standard operating guidelines collectively. But also sharing those resources in times where, you know, there's a larger incident. It, it really has significantly improved our, our capability to handle major emergencies as, as well as handle multiple emergencies at the same time, not only in Mount Pleasant, but also countywide. Mm -hmm. And also just that, that collective intelligence and that resource sharing between all the departments has really been good. So we've seen some, some good things out of that group. Um, we meet frequently, we meet monthly with these these other departments to you know talk about kind of the pros and the cons and what we can work on together. In January, the Isle of Palms joined on with us as well. So now we're up to seven departments in the area. Um, so it's been really good. Yes, sir. So Chief, as we're sitting right now, what are the pros and cons to this aid? Right. So, you know, in Mount Pleasant, we have seven stations. We have uh, 10 units every day, two battalion chiefs. So we're spread out effectively, but, you know, in the, during a big incident, especially in the heat, especially this time of year, um, the firefighters get taxed pretty quickly just because of what they're dealing with. So to be able to, to have those other resources from other jurisdictions come in automatically to, one, make our firefighters safer to, to kind of rotate them in and out of that fire scene. Um, but also if there's multiple incidents um, and happening in Mount Pleasant and other jurisdictions, we can also have units cover at our stations in case a, you know, a second call or a third call happens. So, you know, we're sharing resources with the city most frequently with Isle of Palm just because we share borders and they're, they're sharing with us. But ultimately, it's a group that's is nearly countywide at this point. And, uh, and yeah, it's been good. And Chief, you talked earlier, obviously, about those multiple incidents and, you know, responding to other calls and other jurisdictions, jurisdictions that is. How many have you all had to obviously uh, run out to in the past six months? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, there's normally uh, four or five a day, meaning they'll they'll get called over here, whichever department it is, for a couple of calls. We'll respond over there, and you know, on a daily basis, it's not those those big calls, those big fires, because those those are infrequent occurrences. Luckily, um, on a daily basis, it's things like fire alarms or things like vehicle accidents on the on the shared bridges, to where you know the city and Mount Pleasant respond to the Ravenel Bridge because we kind of share that resource. So on a daily basis. You know, it's four or five calls where we're sharing it and they're sharing resources with us. Um, those bigger type calls are, are more infrequent, but it's really nice to have those resources or to share our resources when they're needed for those bigger calls. And Chief, what other resources do you, that, does your department that is, have because of this new aid? Right. So, it, you know, it adds, you know, the marine units, it adds hazardous materials units, it adds the all the specialized training that, you know, not only our people have, but um, kind of the collective group, if you have, you know, a major call at the port and you need a lot of personnel that understand ropes and rigging and things of that nature, not only are we relying on us, but we can call in specialists from other departments to, to really handle these unique situations uh, effectively and, and quickly. Now, Chief, let me ask you this. You talk about collective. How has that collective intelligence from this aid helped you all and strengthen your department? Yeah, great question. I think through all the levels, from firefighter um, all the way up to, to chief, um, we're really lucky in Charleston. We have a, a very humble group of, of firefighters and 
and captains and battalion chiefs and chiefs that really just want to work together, that want to work together for for the good of not only their organization, but the good of Charleston County and the good of the Tri-County area as a whole. So, you know, being able to bounce ideas off each other, being able to, to call somebody and say, hey, you know, I, I, I'm having this this difficulty. How, how have you handled that? It is good to have that network in, in our area. And, you know, it's not only the, the auto aid group. You know, there's there's 14 area departments in Charleston, so seven are on board with this auto aid. But even the others that are just part of that mutual aid agreement, just just having them in the room, we meet monthly at the Charleston County Fire Chiefs Association and, and is one of the forums where we meet. And, and again, we work through issues, we, we work through problems, we, we share some of the some of the victories that we've had. So it really is a close-knit group, and, and it's good to have those resources to be able to call and, and figure out problems. And what problems have you all solved collectively? Good question. You know, we had a meeting yesterday, and, and really it's we're always trying to fine-tune, trying to, to provide the best service to the community. So yesterday we were talking about some, some dispatch um the order of dispatch, you know, the questions that are asked, and if you ask a different way to make it a little bit quicker, to make it better on the dispatcher. So always looking for those small nuanced things that, that we can solve as a group, that we can kind of come together and, 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 and work those things out. Now that you all have come together, Chief, how, what, what have you learned exactly from these other departments that now you're implementing with your department? Yeah, great question. You know, before this, I mean, our department is strong. Our training culture has always been strong. Uh, we're blessed to, to, to hire some, some really incredible and really intelligent people. But just like anything, the, the more people that you expose yourself to, that, that may have some tricks to, to, to do something a little bit different way or, or to solve a problem a little bit different way, that only adds to, you know, our intelligence. And then the same, like we're, a, our personnel are able to share with the other departments. So, um, just through that joint training, just getting to know each other, just seeing each other on calls and working through these things. It, it really has become a, a very close knit group. Now, Chief, you talked earlier about training. So, how many people have you been able to recruit with your new training? Yeah, excellent question. So, you know, our previous training model, we would send um, send new recruits to either the state fire academy or local fire department, and and those options were great. They they got some incredible training there. But a couple of years ago, um, we've gone through two cycles of this. Now, we decided to bring the recruit model in-house, meaning that from the time they're hired to the time they're certified, everything is done in Mount Pleasant. We're lucky to have a training facility in Mount Pleasant that we can utilize, but we brought all of that training in-house from firefighter all the way to medical training and, and made it a six-month process. And what we found is that, that that culture, that Mount Pleasant culture that we're trying to, to instill in them, we can do that from day one. And they become a part of the family from day one. We don't have to send them off to another place, even though the training was great. We were able to retain them here, do that family concept, train them from day one. Um, September this year, September 11th, our next recruit school starts, um, and we will have 16 personnel on that from Mount Pleasant. And then even sharing with our other departments, we'll have some uh, some spots for them as well. Not everybody is lucky enough to have a training facility like we are, so we'd like to open up that class if we have spots to others. So 16 from Mount Pleasant with maybe a goal of 20 to 25 total in the class as we share our facility with other departments as well. And I'm looking right at that because that's four weeks from now. So how many spots do you have available now? So we're full at this point. Um, as far as all of our 16, um, they've been through the entire process. Obviously, it's a pretty intensive process just to, to become a firefighter with the background checks and the multiple layers that they have to go through. So um, we've gotten all the 16 through. And then we're, we're finalizing with some of those other departments um, of how many personnel they're going to put in. So I think at this point, we're close to about 20. Now, Chief, you mentioned earlier about the family culture. Let me ask you, how do you actually build a sheer vision from all ranks of your department? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, that's something that I think every organization struggles with. It's definitely something as a chief that I struggle with is, is, is communication. There's times when I, I'm, you know, I'm focused on a project and I'm not listening enough. I'm not communicating enough out to to the stations so especially this past year we really tried to over communicate meaning that sometimes it may feel like we're communicating enough but ultimately we probably aren't so um going out to the stations having quarterly meetings meeting with the captains really involving our our battalion chiefs our battalion chiefs are the shift supervisors they're the, the supervisors actually out on the street running the call so really involving them in that decision making process um Sometimes what seems like a great idea up here um, really doesn't work in the street. And we need to hear that. We need to hear, okay, that's not working. How can we change it? 
So really building that culture, I think, comes out of communication. We've had an increased focus on that, and it's something that we're always going to have to push for. I don't think you can really ever communicate enough or effectively enough, especially when, you know, we have seven stations, three different shifts. There's always people coming and going. They're always busy with calls. So we're really trying to focus on that communication. And where else do you want to focus that communication at, Chief? Right. Good question. So we've actually, we're coming up on our, the renewal of our five-year strategic plan. Um, we did our plan back in 2018 and it ran from 2019 through 2023. So this is the last year of that plan. We've accomplished a lot of those goals that were in that plan. But as part of a strategic planning process, you know, we have to reach out not only to the community, communicate with them, you know, reach out internally from what our personnel are seeing, reach out to our area of fire departments and and see what they're seeing and really bring all that together into a plan. So we're in the process of that now. We're we're we're, we're building our questions. We're, we're kind of getting our meetings set up. So we will be kind of communicating that out and receiving that feedback so that we can build another five-year plan. And Chief, speaking of the community, what are those community outreach initiatives that you want to implement into this uh, strategic plan? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and something that we've kind of focused on, you know, with COVID, Unfortunately, we, we kind of lost touch with the community with that hands-on stuff. You know, our, our social media presence is strong, but really, we want to be out there in the community teaching and training and, and working with people with CPR. So just really an increased focus on that. Like, what does the community want to learn? What does the community want to see um, as far as training aspect? You know, getting out there into the schools, you know, interacting with children, and then also, like I mentioned, hosting those those uh, CPR trainings and first aid trainings and things that we can share with the community because with especially something like CPR, we, we look at it as, you know, the people that we train in CPR, the people that we train in first aid, they're pretty much an extension of our fire department. So if somebody can start CPR before we get there, if it takes us five minutes to get there and we've trained somebody in CPR and they can kind of begin that action, honestly, they can, they can affect somebody's life and they can save a life. And we've seen it multiple times where a bystander starts CPR, starts first aid, and really has saved, saved lives. So we want that training out there. We want them to be an extension of our department. And, and that's kind of been the focus this past year. Wow. Oh, so how many people, I, I would say, would want to have signed up already for CPR training with the uh, town of Mount Pleasant? Yeah, I think we're averaging about 700 a year. Um, it's something that we host uh, monthly, and you can find that on our website if you go to mpfd.com. That'll kind of link you to that town page and to our fire department page. Um, and you can find that over on the left-hand side to sign up for our CPR class. It's free. We do it monthly, um, and we'd love to have you be a part of that. I mentioned the police department also does Narcan training on, on a monthly basis. Um, so there are a lot of programs at the town that, that we offer that we'd love to engage with citizens in. and. If you want to sign up, you can't find it on the website. You're, you're happy to call up here to the fire department, and we'll get you plugged in. And Chief, as you mentioned, uh, training that is, and this might be a silly question, but what exactly, what type of training do you want your fighter fighters to get trained on next? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And we do, you know, not only do our firefighters do medical and, and the firefighting response, I, I think most people are familiar with that. But you know, the firefighter really is uh, a person of many hats. They have to know many, many skills. So some of the other things that we do, you know, technical rescue training, that's the ropes and the things that we've talked about, you know, the wildland training for the woods type fires, the marine response, the, you know, specialized swimming rescue response, hazardous materials. So there are a lot of things that we focus on and we're really trying to dial in what that training looks like, what it looks like to be on the hazardous materials team in Mount Pleasant and also countywide. So working with the area training chiefs um, as part of that Charleston County group to, to kind of come up with that list of what that training looks like. So really focusing on that specialized training, building up some of these teams that, that specialize in hazardous materials and marine response and technical rescue. And that's kind of been our focus um, most recently, but also, you know, our training department, our training division here in Mount Pleasant, does a really good job of always kind of focusing back on those basics, always getting back to the basic stuff, you know, the fancy stuff, the technical rescues, you know, that's really interesting and really fun, but you always have to remember where you came from. You always have to go back to those basic skills and our training division, our training chief is really good at, at kind of drawing that back out and saying, okay, let's get back to the square one. I know most of you have been a firefighter for 20 plus years, but let's, 
Let's focus on those basics. Let's hone those skills. So I, I think it goes from that basic part also to that very, very technical part that, that we're able to focus on. Where in the fire department do you see your firefighters going back to the basics on? Um, you know, really, I think a, a couple of areas. Um, we run a lot of medical calls, and, and our personnel are, are incredible at that. So I think with that, with, with the constant um, response on a daily basis, we just have to remember, like, okay, let's, let's go back to focus, even back to CPR for us. You know, our personnel have been trained on CPR for, for many, many years. You know, a lot of these, these personnel have been here 10, 20, 25 years. But it's always good to kind of sharpen your sword, even on the little stuff like that, even on just throwing a ladder, even on just how to properly pull a hose, just really that basic stuff that, you know, it's almost like being a professional athlete. You're training a lot. You're training for game day. You know, games don't happen a lot, but neither do fires. But you want to be on your top of your game physically, mentally. Um, so it's really just repetitions, getting out there and, you know, throwing that ladder 10, 15 times so that when, you know, the actual emergency happens and you need to place that ladder appropriately, that, it, that it, it's just second nature. So that's kind of the, why we focus back on those basics. And Chief, as we sit here right now, how many engines do you have and how many ladders do you actually have? Good question. So we run uh, six engines every day, two ladders, uh, two squad units, which are primarily medical response, but are also staff, cross-staffed by firefighters, so they can do both, and then two battalion chiefs every day. Now, Chief, I know that the department promised in 2019 to increase staffing in your strategic plan for the fire department. So what was your original goal then, and what's your goal now to actually increase that in the next five years? Yes. So we were able to do some of that initially early on, back in that time frame. You know, town council was able to give us six additional personnel to, to increase our staffing on the ladders, and then we applied for a federal safer grant and got another six personnel, so that, that was 12 in that time frame. Um, but the goal in the strategic plan was to, to bring daily staffing up to four. So we, we currently staff each unit with four personnel, but with, with sick leave and vacation time and things of that nature, um, sometimes we'll drop down to that three level on a daily basis. So the goal is still through grants and, and funding to eventually get that staffing to where it's four minimum every day. And there's times where we can achieve that with some of our units. But we're still going to continue to, to focus on that. We'll continue to push that into our next strategic plan um, and, and shoot toward that goal. Now, how many grants do you need right now? Well, that's a, uh, another great question. And, and the way we look at grants is that, you know, it's important for us to be fiscally responsible with the taxpayer's money. If it's something that we can go out after for a grant, so putting it in our operations budget or we can use that operations budget money to purchase something else. Um, we really like to go after those grants and we've been successful. We have some very talented people that, that work for us that, that write grants. Um, the next one I think we're going for, we're looking at for some uh, community training things like we talked about. Uh, we really want a fire extinguisher trainer and some other these things that we can bring that fire extinguisher training to the community. Um, but ultimately, the town's always been very, very good. If the grant process doesn't work and it's something that is a, a need of the department, you know, we've always been able to get those things in the budget um, because it, it really is important to kind of get that training out to the citizens. And I should know this, but I, I, when, when does you, well, what's the town's budget? When does that actually, well, the, the, you know, the fiscal year start, I should say? Yeah, so we're July 1st. July so 1st. We just, just entered a new fiscal year about a month and a half ago. And what's your total budget? Uh, for the fire department with salaries and everything, uh, we're at about $16 million. Now, that doesn't count the, the some of the capital improvement stuff with uh, fire station renovations, fire station um, builds, uh, apparatus, things of that nature. So our, our, it's kind of in a couple of places. Our operating budget is about $16 million this year. Um, I'll mention that, you know, fire station seven on Bowman road, yes. so it's, it's our oldest station has been there since the seventies. It was actually a building and a piece of land that the county needed to us a couple of years ago. Um, and that's our next big project that we're focusing on. That's going to be a complete tear down and rebuild, um, started that process with the architects now. So that, you know, that, that's an $8 million project. That's not included in that 16 million. So there's a lot of some projects out there that we're working on. We're really excited about the station seven just to, you know, improve capacity of the building, you know, make it bigger, not only for increased personnel in the future, 
you know, larger size apparatus, uh, but also just resiliency of the building. You know, we live in an area that's prone to hurricanes, earthquakes, um, and the age of that building, we really want to get something there that, that can withstand some of that, be a resilient piece of, of the community response. Now, Chief, okay, with that, uh, with uh, Building 7 there, and I, I'm looking at it right now, Bowman Road, is that actually in the uh, capital projects budget? Yes. Okay. It should be in there. It's a phase funding. Okay. Um, um, over the next three to four years, the, the funding is phased. So, yeah, it, it is funded, and it's... Um, We've had our first meeting with the architect about a month ago, so that project is is, is ready to go. Now, uh, how much has the fire apparatus changed in the past five years? You know, the, the apparatus market, just like a lot of supply chains globally, have, have have really changed. In the past, we could we could get a truck in twelve months. You know, we could order a custom truck, we could work with the company, and we'd have that truck in twelve months. Um, we're looking at thirty to forty eight month build times at this point. For fire apparatus. So just the supply chain on fire apparatus um, has really slowed down. We've been able to, uh, with the support of the town and, and the finance department, move up some of our our trucks and order them a little bit quicker, just anticipating those, those long um, delivery times. We have two new trucks coming in the spring. We have a new engine and a new ladder uh, that are set to, to show up next spring. We have another engine on order. We have uh, a lot of small vehicles on the order. So we've, we've been able to kind of work through it, work around it, and, and get those those apparatus ordered. Uh, but yeah, that that the ordering process and the delivery process has definitely changed over the past five years. And, and hopefully to see a little bit of a turnaround and, and have some of those build times lowered. But, you know, we're, we're, we're moving ahead forward like they're not going to and anticipating some of those needs. Now, how many total uh, trucks are there in total? That we've ordered? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we have an engine and a ladder um, that are coming in 2024. Um, mm -hmm. We've heard an, an additional replacement engine in this budget year, and that's we're trying to get that toward the 30-month build time. It all depends on options and things that are either done at the plant or done locally. Um, we have an, another ladder truck that's also been ordered. That's our, our second replacement ladder, and that's about a 48-month build time. That's a very technical piece of apparatus, so that's going to take some time. Um, we have a new brush truck coming. Um, several of our battalion chief vehicles have been replaced. Uh, we have another, a couple of small vehicles um, for the fire marshal division and different things that are ordered. Uh, so we, we have several vehicles out there. I, I don't have a, a good count right in front of me, but we have, you know, four big pieces of apparatus, actual fire trucks, and then probably four to six uh, smaller vehicles that are on order as well. Now, Chief, why when the town has 60,000 people, your department only had four letters, four ladders, and now with 95,000 residents, your department only has two. Do you view automatic aid as reason not to get Mount Pleasant Fire Department up to where it belongs for a town of 95,000 residents? No, and automatic aid was not, you know, intended to, to not, you know, make the Mount Pleasant Fire Department or any of the fire department grow. You know, it, it just... It made sense uh, for what the response is. Obviously, in our strategic plan, we still have goals. You know, in, in the current strategic plan, we, we talk about a third ladder, hmm. um, like we talked about before. Um, so, yeah, automatic aid is, is not a, a reason not to continue to grow the Mount Pleasant Fire Department, not to continue to look for, for ways that we can improve as a department. It was simply uh, something that we researched that made sense, that made sense for our community and for the other communities. And, you know, a lot of that stuff that we talked about, just the training and the sharing of resources and um, and all those those plus sides of it. Now, I know recently there was a 23-minute response time from the Isle of Palms to Dunes West for a recent house fire. Also, there was a 20-minute response from Foster Road to the same fire in Dunes West. So why is there like a 20 to 23-minute response time? Is that actually accessible? And is it accept acceptable, acceptable to you, Chief? Well, uh, I don't know specifically which car you're, you're talking about, but, um, you know, even in that Dunesville area, that, that's a place that, that automatic aid helps. You know, we, we put a station out there anticipating years ago that the Rivertown community, the Dunesville community was, were going to be large communities and we knew we needed a station. But also having the city of Charleston close by on that Clements Ferry Road, sure. you know, bringing them in from that north area to where, you know, that's that news West station is kind of on our border. We really couldn't build another station 
but, you know, farther north than that. So having that city station out there responding from the Clements Ferry Road area um, really does help with some of those response times and getting those initial units there there quickly. But, you know, it's something that we're always looking at, our response times, how we can kind of build resiliency, where are the units coming from, um, and you know, and, and ways that we can get better. Now, I know that the fire department has also been reportedly out of service for many, many months, allegedly for a $10,000 repair. So what is the timetable for that to actually get repaired? So, you know, talking about grants, we'll, we'll circle back from that. We, we did get a grant to um, initially buy that boat. So that boat came from a grant. We've had that boat for over 10 years now. It's been a very good piece of apparatus. Um, but also, it's time for a refurbishment, as you know, with boats, especially in salt water. You know, they take a they take a, a, a pretty good lick. So it is time to, to refurbish that boat. We did get an additional grant. Um, and we're, we're in the procurement process now. We do want to put, uh, new engines on it, paint the hole, new electronics, rebuild the fire pump. So it is time for that boat to get a, a complete overhaul. Um, as far as time frame, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of in negotiations with a couple of different things now and, and really getting that boat into the shop, getting it repaired and getting it back out there. Oh, and quickly, in 20 seconds, I know the department has a rescue boat, but does the boat actually have pumps for fighting fighting? Yeah, so our, our, our main boat that's down does have a firefighting pump. The, our secondary boat um, has a temporary pump on it. And then, in, you know, in those cases, a lot of our aid partners are out there as well that, that have fire boats in the city of Charleston, North Charleston, Johns Island. So we kind of share that Metro Marine group uh, together for the fire boats. Mike Chief Mike Nixon with the town of Mount Pleasant. Thank you for your time on Quentin's Close Ups. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome.